That's right, it's a scam. K kinda. A little bit. Mostly. Look, since the beginning of the television era, manufacturers have always tried to market new generations of TVs to get consumers to replace their old television sets with new ones. Now, oftentimes, these advancements have been very real, like the move from black and white to color CRTs, or from standard definition to HD. That happened about 20 years ago. Wow. However, other times it's less convincing, like 3D TVs. <laughs> Remember those? Yeah, they don't exist anymore. Or uh, a few years ago, where everyone tried to tell us that curved displays were gonna be a thing. They weren't. Now, while technology improves massively with every passing year, and the $1,000 TV of today certainly outperforms the $1,000 TV of a few years ago, a universal truth is this. Low-end product is typically garbage. In most instances, a cheapo $350 4K TV, impressive as it may seem, is still no match for, say, a Pioneer Kuro 6020, a 12-year-old plasma TV with a cult following that had an original retail price of $5,500. Sure, it was only 1080p, but it had superb black levels and shadow detail with colors that many TVs today still can't beat. The reason that it's important to remember all this is that HDR, a term which has now been marketed for a couple years and will only become more common, is really complicated, with even low-end TVs now boasting an HDR badge on the box. But what is HDR? Human vision, our eyeballs, and our brain, because that's part of our vision system, are capable of seeing both dark and bright scenes simultaneously. Now, while they often need a few minutes to adjust, our eyes can see inside an extremely dark room, even making out shadow and object detail. But the inverse is also true, as we're able to adjust our eyes to see on a sunny day. Dynamic range, or DR, is the ratio between the darkest point in an image, pure black, and the brightest point in an image, pure white. Go outside for a minute, okay? Get off YouTube and do an experiment with me. <laughs> Go find a tree and look underneath a tree where it's shaded, but there are rays of sun casting through the leaves. Once adjusted, your eyes will be able to make out the detail from both the very dark and very bright patches of light. Uh, let me put it this way. Have you ever tried to take a picture of someone in front of a sunset? It doesn't work. <laughs> because the person you're taking a picture of has very little light on their face, and the sun behind them is very, very brilliant. And so what happens is that your average camera simply can't capture the photo. Either the person's body will be a textureless silhouette black blob, or the sunset behind them will be so white it'll seem like you took the photo against your living room wall. HDR attempts to help cameras, and television displays, present a similar range of luminance that we are used to seeing with human eyeballs. This sounds great, right? Well, it is, except for there's a problem. There's no singular HDR standard, and there's nothing that says that the screen on the TV you're buying must display a certain range of brightness or darkness or number of colors, etc. This is a lot different than, say, resolution, which is defined by an exact number of pixels. You can't be 4K if you don't have 4,000 pixels across the top of your display. So you're at Best Buy walking down the aisle and you see a generic HDR logo on a television set that seems like it's a good price and a good size. That logo probably means that the TV supports HDR10, an open source, royalty-free, and most common form of HDR. Uh, HDR10 was established by the CEA, which is the same folks that put on the CES convention in Las Vegas every year. Well, not next year, but most years. HDR10 does have certain standards that televisions must meet to be HDR10 certified. However, max luminance or brightness is not one of them. Now, this might seem a bit stupid, right? If the TV doesn't get very bright, it can't emulate bright subjects that our eyes see and can't be high dynamic range, right? Well, take for example an OLED TV. LG is well known for making some of the best televisions in the industry, and the LG GXPUA, which they provided to us for this video, is no exception. Now, unlike LCDs, which have a backlight turned on, OLED pixels are individually self-lit. 
This creates an unparalleled, almost surreal movie watching experience, especially in a dark room. Unfortunately, because OLED TVs can suffer pretty severe consequences from bright light emittance, like burn-in and premature wear, OLED TVs, they just don't get very bright. This unit behind me can only hit a peak brightness of about 660 nits. Oh, and one nit is equal to one candela per square meter. 660 nits on this OLED TV is a lot less than, say, something like a Vizio P-Series LCD television, which has a peak brightness of over 2,700 nits, and it costs one quarter as much money as this TV. But remember, dynamic range isn't so much a measure of luminance or peak brightness, rather a measure of contrast. Because OLED TVs have individually lit pixels, when a pixel is supposed to be black, it is. It's 100% black because it's turned off. This is very unlike even the best zone-lit LCDs, where there's a backlight which can bleed and create sections of gray pixels where it really should be black. Now, LCDs counteract this effect by increasing the total luminance of the highlights, making them so bright that those grays seem darker. That's often why you'll find the funny, if not technically true, infinite contrast label on OLED TVs, because the pixels are quite literally not on, and you can't measure luminance from a pixel not emitting light. This doesn't mean that OLED TVs are always better, though. If you're in a very bright room, an OLED TV will actually seem dimmer than a bright LCD because, well, A, it is, <laughs> it's not as luminous, but B, you won't be able to perceive those deep, inky blacks of OLED. And the slight light bleed of traditional LCDs, well, it'll just seem like a non-issue because the room's wide dynamic range counteracts that effect. Now, on the other hand, cheap LCD TVs experience the worst of both worlds. Severe backlight bleeding because unlike higher-end locally dimmed quantum dot televisions, cheaper TVs usually only have a single backlighting zone. On top of that, the individual panels just don't get very bright. The best-selling TV on Amazon has a measly peak brightness of just 207 nits. That's less than a third of the relatively dim OLED TV I have behind me. While that and other cheaper LCD TVs may be capable of receiving an HDR input, their ability to actually display them can be extremely limited. The shadows and blacks are just not very black, and the highlights or bright parts of the image are not very bright, they're pretty dim. And so the end result is an HDR video signal that looks worse, less contrasty, and grayer than a standard dynamic range video that we're all kind of used to. So then how do I know if the HDR TV I bought is any good? Well, it's complicated. Attempts have been made to certify televisions as real or true HDR, with the Ultra HD Alliance creating the UHD Premium certification an entity that has required a 20,000 to 1 contrast ratio at 1,000 nits, that's mostly for LCDs, or a 1 million to 1 contrast ratio at 540 nits, again, mostly for OLEDs. But given that the most recently certified LG TV by the UHD Alliance is a four-year-old OLED, I don't really think this whole program worked out, and it seems kind of dead. So enter the format war. Just as with Blu-ray and HD DVD, or Betamax and VHS, HDR has its fighters. HDR10, as we previously mentioned, is by far the most popular format, despite its faults. So, in an attempt to help out a bit, Samsung created HDR10+. Plus. Now, the headlining feature of the Plus version over the standard HDR10 is that it uses dynamic metadata, which allows to more accurately adjust brightness levels of up to 10,000 nits on a scene-by-scene -scene or frame-by-frame -frame basis, rather than HDR10's average light level method, which doesn't lend itself too well to newer, better TVs. The only problem? Well, despite Samsung claiming it to be royalty-free, few television brands have seemed to jump on board. 
And that's mostly because they have all supported a feature and a HDR standard that Samsung has seemingly refused to support, Dolby Vision. You've probably heard of Dolby Vision. Uh, now, Dolby Vision isn't free, unlike the HDR10 standards, and it's proprietary. It's rumored to cost about $3 per TV, which is probably why Samsung doesn't want to use it. But its specs are very similar to that of HDR10+, save for the fact that it uses 12-bit color instead of 10-bit color. Now, today, that doesn't really mean much, but it will into the future. So we've got Dolby Vision on one side and HDR10 Plus on the other. The two big format winners, it seems. And then in the middle, we've got Samsung HDR10 Plus. Stop trying to make it happen, Samsung. It's not gonna happen. But there are new formats on the horizon. For one, we've got HLG, a format co-developed by the British BBC and Japan's NHK. Now, what makes this format special is that it's actually backwards compatible with older SDR TVs. This is big news for broadcast television, one signal that works on both types of TVs. Pretty exciting. Now, this does come with limitations in the picture quality department for HDR, but it's expected to gain popularity anyways, as it's part of the upcoming broadcast standard ATSC 3.0. Lastly, we have Advanced HDR by Technicolor. Now, it's not widely supported yet, but it is included in ATSC 3.0, so will be expected to gain popularity in the next couple years. Basically, it uses HLG as a base, but then adds dynamic metadata, which are offered by HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision, making it potentially the best of all, assuming it picks up in popularity. Confused yet? Yeah, me too. Look, the good news is that unlike your Xbox 360's HD DVD drive, there likely won't be a single winner, and most television shipping today support multiple standards, which is good news for us, the consumers. Though it is confusing. At the end of the day, do you really care what standard is being used or what's supported by what as long as it looks as good as possible? The fact I mentioned in the beginning remains true. The HDR codec and content is not as important as the physical hardware you're playing it back on. Cheap TVs will continue to have poor weak luminance, lousy dynamic range, and an overall disappointing HDR experience sometimes even worse than standard dynamic range. Buy the best TV you can afford and worry less about the specs and more about the beautiful content that filmmakers around the world are creating every day. Take it from me, a recovering audiophile, this kind of stuff isn't worth obsessing over. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome videos like this one, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.